Um, this is the history of Node.js streams as I see it. So, um, part one, create stream. So, once upon a time, um, there was this math grad student <clears throat> who dropped out and went traveling to Chile and he ended up doing freelance web development instead of teaching English because um, he nearly completely ran out of money and stuff like this. Um, in a strange foreign country where it was winter, he thought he was going there on, on time. But there's, there's much more. He gives a talk about that at some point. Um, so that was Ryan Dow. And then later, he saw a photo upload progress bar on Flickr. And that inspired him to create Node.js. Long story short. Um, OK, so in the early Node, um, before small or equal to version 0.2, um, just anything could, could kind of happen. Um, there was a, a, there was, in the documentation it did have streams, but the streams were just event emitters that happened to have particular events. Um, so this is, this is an example that I took from the actual uh, document, from the old documentation. Um, so notice that it doesn't use pipe. So this is an echo server. So the, something connects, sends data to it, and the server just sends the same data back with, a, with this at the start. Um, so that, that was a, it's been a simple example for how Node worked for quite a while. So <clears throat> that's what it looks like in, um, like, in, start of, in like 2010. That's what it looked like when I um, came to it. Was anyone using Node back at this point? No one, okay. Uh, well, this, this is what it used to be like. Um, so you would just, see this is basically, you're just piping it yourself. When data comes in, you just write it back to the output. Um, and that, that was fine, that was like what you saw on the website, that was what everyone did. Um, and then a while later, uh, slide's too long, um, people started to notice that you'd do the same code each time. So they made this module called, uh, they put this utility function to do it for you uh, on the sys, which is also depreciated now. That's now all that stuff is in util. Um, and you have sys.pump, and you passed in the input and the output. In this case, we're piping the same thing back into itself, so it's just the socket to the socket, and it makes it much simpler. Um, I remember seeing um, Ryan tweet this one time. Um, but I couldn't find that. So, um, then in 0.4.2, the documentation on the front page changed. At this point, you had um, socket, um, you had got the pipe method. So basically, sys.pump moved onto the stream itself, and you had a stream subclass of the event emitter that all of the streams. Um, inherited from. So everything got this pipe method. <clears throat> um, it was still a bit awkward to create a stream. Like you would just create an instance, you had to set readable and writable to be true, otherwise it would just not work, it would just fail silently. Um, and then you implemented everything else yourself. So the, in theory you had this like back pressure for like pause, you had to pause and resume. Does everyone know what back pressure means? You do. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> so back, back pressure just means like, say if you're trying to push a whole bunch of stuff into a pipe, uh, water or whatever, like plumbing is a very apt metaphor, um, the pipe starts pushing back because it can't fit anything, anything more. And could, because there's only a, a finite number of, amount of space in the pipe, so if stuff hasn't moved through out the other side, you can't put, put any more in. And, um, <clears throat> and physical systems has this naturally, because there's only so much room at the pipe. If you put too much in, the pipe burst. So you want to be sensitive to the back pressure and um, not clog the system. And so Streams um, did this, which basically inherited from, um, from TCP, um, which needed to... Um, does anyone know how TCP works? Cool, cool. Um, so 
the important thing um, about um, TCP or right here is that TCP gives you the illusion of like a phone, of a steady, reliable phone connection. But it's a lie. It's actually um, underneath, it's given your, it prints out your, each bit of your message on a piece of paper and puts that on a pigeon and then tells the pigeon to fly somewhere. And some of the pigeons um, don't arrive. <laughs> um, but the other side will just send pigeons back. They'll be like, hey, what happened to, to, to that pigeon? And you're like, oh, I don't know, we'll just send another one. And <clears throat> there's quite a clever way in TCP where if your, your pigeons start dying, maybe there's, there's a hawk that's eating them or something like this, you just slow down the rate that you send pigeons. Um, and you like sort of step back uh, exponentially. So when, when you start to notice pigeons are dying, you, just, you drop back to like half the amount of pigeons. And then the hawk, eventually you find the right, right where the hawk gets is satisfied or, or, or flies off to find more pigeons somewhere else. So then, then you can say slowly, then you slowly increase the amount of pigeons as well. And that's like, that, um, that's back pressure. And, um, and so you also have this when you are like writing to a file or something because there's only so much write to disk can take at the time or <coughs> pretty much everything um, that has a finite number of uh, finite resources has um, some kind of back pressure. Like if you're, talking, if you're talking to someone and they look confused, that's back pressure. That means to like slow down and be more careful about how you're explaining something. So yeah, so streams existed, but they weren't very, they, you could use them, they weren't very easy to use. So um, that was part one. Part two, the stream revelation, streams in user land. So then, um, so my personal stream um, revelation, so um, back, this was uh, 2011, um, I, was, I had this like mad science project that was like this massive like testing system and so I needed um, these like jobs came through that were like tests that I had to run and then I had to run these but I would have like finite, I knew I would have finite resources and tests could take varying amount of times, varying, varying amount of time so I would pass work to them and they would start to do them but when things get clogged I had to like stop sending them stuff. And when I saw the, when I read about the streams API, I realized that this was exactly what I needed. And what's more, it meant that since you have this pipeline of things and one part does one thing and then it passes it to the next part, so one part prepares the, the test, another part you know, get, retrieves the resources it needs and one part actually runs the test then one part formats the results and stuff like this. So that if you did need to, um, that's next. Okay, so here's, here's the basic pattern of like what a pipe, a stream might look like. You'd have like the input, and then it pipes it to something that um, transforms that in some way, and then you pipe that to the output. Now, because this is already the shape of I.O., if you're putting just objects with other data or information through it, um, you, can, you can cut it up any way you like, because it's already the same shape as I.O., so all you need to do is serialize it in between, you just split this apart and put a thing that serializes it, sends it to another machine, and it will still work exactly the same. You won't really have to change your code, you'll just have to add a bit of stuff to deal with the serialization and deserialization. Um, so if we needed to take something like, that looked like this and then run it across multiple machines, we'd just change it to look like this. So we'd take the input, we'd pipe it to a serializer, then we'd connect to um, the through stage and send it there. And then the through stage has a server, um, it deserializes it, it does whatever it, it transformation it does, then it reserializes it, and then it sends it to the output. And the output just does the same thing. It's simple. And um, if you, so if you use streams, you can, it's easy to, um, to scale up um, because the, the shape of your API, of how you do things, is exactly the same as the shape of I.O. So turning it into something that runs across multiple computers is um, nearly, tri nearly trivial. 
Okay, so I started writing stream modules. Okay, so the first thing I did was this module called Event Stream that used, um, basically the idea was I'll just make the, streams are kind of like arrays, but like a series of events in time instead of space. So I will make the, um, I'll just implement things like the map function and the reduce function like you get on, um, just like you get on um, regular, on, on arrays and so on. And um, other things like um, the split function which would take uh, input and then, which would be like just blobs of, of text and it would split it into lines. So then you could easily parse that and handle that in a particular way. And you could just drop that in, say like you could parse a CSV file by splitting it into lines and for each line splitting it into, uh, by commas and so on. It's, it was very, very simple to work like that and you could, and it would automatically work with, you know, arbitrarily large uh, inputs. Um, but at this stage, this was in 0 0.4, um, the, you couldn't, um, source.pipe wasn't chainable yet. It, um, it didn't return, it just returned null, so you had to pipe each stage together. So um, I made a function to combine that. But then that was, that was changed in 0.6. So here's another one I wrote uh, early on, um, JSON stream, um, which allowed you to parse a um, like arbitrary large um, JSON documents, like you could parse, uh, you could load hundreds of megabytes of um, JSON um, if you streamed it and parsed it out as you go. Um, but if you if you loaded that all into memory and then parsed it with JSON dot parse, um, you'll get an out of memory error. Now, this is one of my most popular modules, but all of the hard work was actually done by Tim Caswell. He wrote a module called JSON Parse that did this, but it just didn't expose a nice um, API or a standard stream, so um, everybody uses this one. So I got all the credit for writing the wrapper around it. Um, then a little bit later, um, I wrote a small, so one of Substack's like uh, first like famous modules was uh, RPC, this really like clever RPC module called Dnode. Um, but after I had my stream um, revelation, I realized that Dnode was wrong, or at least it got one particular thing wrong. And so I wrote, um, so it looked like this. Um, so what the problem is that Dnode would wrap a server. So you would create a server that was a Dnode server. Now you could make a TCP server, but you could also use Socket.io to make a, a WebSocket server. But those are all it could do. If you had another kind of um, networking, like you couldn't make one over SSH. And I was like, that, that is wrong because the networking layer should be totally separate from the streaming layer. So I wrote a module to troll, I wrote my own RPC module that worked like this to troll Substack into fixing um, his, you can, and you can ask him about that next month. So this is what I said, I had a rant in my readme and I was like, this is what it should look like. You should be able to get like a remote, a remote stream and then say you, to Oh, actually it makes more sense to start here. So we get our RPC stream, then we'll compress it, then we'll encrypt it, then we'll send it to the remote side, and then that goes off over the internet and comes back over here. The stream from the other side comes in, we can decrypt it, then we can unzip it, then we send it back into the RPC stream. So these are all completely um, I mean, we don't, we don't have to enclose these, these are optional, but we are able to do so because the networking layer, the SSH stream, and the, um, and the RPC layer they are completely separate, except that they, um, they don't use a networking, have a built-in networking layer, all they have is uh, they implement an abstract stream interface, uh, the abstract IO interface. Um, and so I, I put this in my readme with a, a rant and then a, a spot, um, a line that was like, this is where I'll put a link to Dnode when Dnode can do this as well. And a few weeks later, Dnode could do that. And so um, now you can use Dnode. 
and then a little bit after that, um, Substack um, th threw out Socket.io, um, only kept this API as a convenience wrapper, and then um, implemented a thing, uh, a module show, which was also a wrapper around another module, um, uh, around, around a project called Sock.js that gave you a um, Socket.io like, has anyone used Socket.io? See if everyone, does, does anyone not know what it is? Everyone knows what Socket.io is? Yep. Okay. So, um, Sock.js was a, a more disciplined um, um, web, uh, web socket um, implementation with fallbacks like Socket.io was, except by the more disciplined, I meant it didn't have so much shit in it. Um, Socket.io just had a whole bunch of features that were like just all kinds of things. It just like put a whole bunch of stuff in. That made a really nice example, but it wasn't any kind of clean um, abstraction. So with show, it's just like using a networking layer. Um, you just create a, a stream by passing it a, a path that will connect to your server. And then this part is just like any other stream. Um, and this, this really, okay, so this is in the browser, but we're doing, we're writing node style code. And um, Substack really made this all possible by implementing Browserify. Um, and a lot of the, the user land streaming was stuff that would run in browsers and let you do um, browsers, um, no, would do you streams in the browser um, and communicate with um, the node with your node servers in the same sort of way. And most of these modules that I'm talking about um, don't even care or know if they're in the browser or not. So, um, should be a separate line in there. Okay, so protocols should not depend on networking. They should be independent. So also see um, Substack's LXGS 2012 talk, harnessing the power of streams. He sums up the summer of streams um, really well. Okay, part three, clash of ideologies. So there's user land and there's core. Um, so meanwhile, um, the node core committers had been um, developing their own stream ideas. So they, they recognized these problems. So it was hard to write streams. Um, back pressure was hard. People complained that you couldn't pipe streams uh, asynchronously. So you couldn't create a stream, wait, and then pipe it somewhere. You would lose packets, and people were very confused by this. So they started uh, working on um, Streams 2. Now, Streams 2 was different to Streams 1. Um, so instead of having a, a data, you had to call a read method on it that pulled data out of it. Um, the data didn't start moving until it was connected together. And um, also there were base classes that made it easy to implement things. Um, but at first, uh, Streams 2 was only for strings or buffers, which broke much of what people were doing in user land. Because people in user land were doing like all kinds of things. Um, um, much with uh, people like, like myself and Substack's encouragement. Oh, sorry. Um, so there's this issue which I think sums it up nicely. So Isaac started working on, on Streams 2 in this readable stream module, and there was an issue uh, number 11. Um, Reynos posted an issue that, that you couldn't send numbers through a readable stream, or at least not zero. Um, and Isaacs replied, like, read should always return either a non-empty string or a buffer, neither of which will ever be falsy. If you're doing this, you are abusing streams and inviting problems. So I. I'd heard this sentiment from a number of um, core developers. So a discussion ensued. My argument uh, summary being, the summary is that um, a stream is just a series of things over time. And if you're not allowed to use the core streams like that, and so the thing is, with the version one streams, you could just do it. They hadn't intended it, but you could do that, and they couldn't stop you because um, JavaScript doesn't have type checking. So you could put anything through a stream, 
and it worked great. Um, so if you made a new kind of streams where you couldn't do that, well you just need another thing that you could do that with and it would be nearly exactly the same as that thing because really the idea of a series of things over time um, that may have back pressure um, is, ge is generic so why not just use core streams to do that. Um, later, um, Isaac closed the issue and said the only definition of chunk is that it can be an argument, chunk is what, what moves, moves through the stream, is that it can be an argument to write. In my opinion, that should be strings or buffers, but others, Dominic Tarr, Reynolds, etc., um, have interesting thing, have done interesting things writing non-buffer things. If your write method takes an array, that's fine, but it can also be other things. The interface shouldn't care too much. So we've gone from abuse to interesting. I was like, this is a huge success. So Streams 2 solved um, much of the problems with Streams 1, but not without introducing new problems. So now there are two modes. There's object mode, oh, there's regular mode, and then there's object mode. Um, if you do stream on data, if you treat the stream like an old stream, it turns back, it behaves in the way that streams used to work. Um, so there's also way, way more code. Like you could read all of the streams code, um, and I did a lot, and now it's like thousands of lines, so it's difficult. Um, and different versions of Node have much more different versions of streams. Um, and in readable stream, the pull, um, the pull stream, uh, the, the readable stream, you pull data out of it, but the writable stream, you still push data into it. It's not the end of the world, but it's not perfect solution either. Um, so I, I see these kind of three classes of streams. You have a push stream, which is what the original node streams were. It's like a tap of water. So you turn on the tap, water comes out, and it's driven by pressure in the tank. So that's, it's the source is pushing the data out. Um, that's how streams one worked. Then you have a pull stream, which is like a drunken straw. This is the reverse where um, if you do nothing, it just sits there. But if you apply vacuum to the other end, that pulls the content through. And then a pump stream is something in, um, is both of those. Um, so you have pumps along the way that pull a little bit and then push a little bit. And so you get content like moving slowly all throughout the system. Um, so there's, this is like um, veins work like this and streams too really work like this as well. I think it's not the simplest um, type of streams but um, we can't uh, change that now. Um, but also it's worth noting that all of these sorts of things occur in nature. Well, at least in civilization. Um, so they're all completely legitimate and have their purposes. Um, the question is just which is the simplest and most appropriate for a given uh, situation. So, um, for example, this is how back pressure worked in, um, in pump streams. So, the source emits readable, and that tells the next stream to pull in a chunk of data. Um, but that, well, except the pump passes it to the next um, emit, the next stream. So that calls write, which in turn causes readable to be emitted, and then that writes it to the sink, to the last thing. But that says I'm paused. So then a message propagates uh, that propagates backwards. So this guy sees that write was false. Um, but the same, in the meantime, the, the source has also emitted data and then that's passed to the, the, pre the middle stream, which is paused because, the, it, it, because pause got propagated to it from the sink. And so now it's paused too, um, and now the source is paused. But the source had to write a whole extra piece of data to get the middle bit, to find out that the middle bit was paused. Um, what would have been um, simpler, I think, is if the pause could just propagate 
immediately through um, the entire pipeline. So when you pause, so when the, the end pauses, the, the source should know about that, even if there are things in the middle. Um, but node streams don't do that. Um, another thing is, if you connect along a uh, pipeline, so there's also, er uh, if the one stream has an error, you have to handle the errors on each individual stream. You can't just connect two um, streams together, and so if the source errors, like it could be a, a TCP connection, HTTP connection that is cut off part way or something like this, so that would um, error. Or it could be um, in the middle, you could have like a, a gzip, something's unzipping the stream or decrypting the stream or parsing the stream, that could have a, a syntax error, that could create an error. You have to handle all these individually. You can't just um, handle one sort of stream on the end or, or one end and be like, when, when it's broken, like handle, give up. You have to um, handle it each bit, which is kind of complicated. So now we have streams two. The stream apocalypse begins. Um, so when there was only one sort of streams, it was easy to say, oh, just use streams, just use node streams, they're perfect. Um, you know, whatever you do, I don't care what you do, just make it compatible with node streams. Um, now node had two different kinds of streams. So it begged the question, how many more kinds of streams could there be? What happens if we started from scratch? What kind of um, streams would we get? Would they be simpler? Would they be better? Um, now this is really a whole nother talk. Um, but I can, I can brush on this briefly. So here's a short list of some of the ones I know about, um, all curated. Um, um, these all have their sort of interesting things, um, or are better in different circumstances. So Reduces was really focused on, um, so Reduces was inspired by Clojure and had a very functional programmy um, sort of thing. It was very, um, another thing, has anyone heard of um, functional reactive programming? Yeah, so functional reactive programming is basically just streams, but looking at it from the completely other end. Um, it's also about values that change um, over time. Um, but whenever you look at it, whenever you discover a uh, functional reactive programming, it's sort of more, it's like got a lot more abstraction and always way too much text in the documentation. They just like have to explain it in great detail. And if you're an impatient procedural programmer who wants to get shit done, um, you just don't tend to go near that at all because it's like, it's too, uh, too confusing. So, um, Reduces was an example of that. So it used functional composition to um, create two pipe streams. Um, so you would read it from right to left instead of left to right. So you'd have a source, and then you pass that to a transform, and then you pass that to a sync. Um, and I never really figured out how it works. Um, but it did have some interesting, it had some other problems and some other interesting things. Like um, it used, um, singleton type singletons to check for the end and error state. So basically it had only one hole and data came through this hole but also errors, sometimes errors came through and the special message came through that was the end of the stream as well. And um, don't put everything through one hole, that's a bad idea. Um, have, have special sorts of holes for different things. Um, and especially in JavaScript, um, especially with the node module system, you don't have good control over singletons, so don't use them. Um, do, um, do like duct type checks for features, that's reliable. Um, expecting that something is an instance of a thing is not necessarily reliable unless there's only one version of that module in the entire tree. Um, having multiple versions of modules only is a problem when you're dealing with singletons, and the wins are way better than the losses of singletons, which are a bit of an anti-pattern anyway. So I strongly just recommend avoiding singletons. Um, 
I had this other experiment, um, a stream. It was minimal, um, minimal streams, it was just a function. So you'd have a function that um, you would call the function with data, and that was writing data to it. If you called the function with a function, that was piping to that function. So you would, you would write a function to it, and then it would pipe to that function with whatever transformation or whatever it had to do. So um, you got to write things left to right um, using functional composition. So you'd be like start, and then call it with the transform, and then pass it to the sync. And this is still very functionally and um, confusing, but it was really simple. Um, but Reynolds convinced me this was a bad idea. Uh, and they're doing it the opposite way is better. So here's another um, take on streams where it's a very simple pull stream. So we have this outer function which creates an instance and then it returns a function that is basically looks like a normal um, no node async function um, where it takes an argument and a callback. Except that you return, you call that, that function repeatedly and always waiting until the callback is called before you called it next. Um, and it, this, this example passes you the elements of an array. So you can, you get the function and then you, you call it until um, it passes back um, until it passes back true in the, in the first slot. Now that, now this bit is a little bit, um, it's a little bit sacrilegious because the first slot in a callback is always an error or nothing. And I made it, um, I made, if it was true, that was the end of the stream, but not an error. Now, I decided to do that because an error and the end are nearly the same. Like they both mean stop. But one is like stop, it's fine. And the other one is like, there's a problem. Um, but either way, you're stopping. So pretty much handling that the same, putting that through the same, same slot is fine. And an end is, a, a, a proper end is kind of boring. You don't need any extra information with it except that that's the end of the, of the data. So passing that as true is completely fine. But errors are much more interesting. There's all kinds of reasons about why, why the error, what, what went wrong. So that has to be a full object. So if you just check if the end is exactly true, then that's the end of the stream. So this is something that reads an array. This is something that um, pulls the array, pulls another stream in. So notice that the big difference between this and um, sorry, I thought I saw something strange. Ghost, ghost letters. Um, so um, instead of having a, like a reader and a writer, you have um, a, a readable and a reader. So you don't write to, there's no writable streams in pull streams. You don't write to a stream, you pass it a readable stream and then it reads it. Um, which is like the distinction between reading a book and watching a movie. You just sit in front of the screen and the movie comes at you and you have no way of, of, of um, then you have to actively pause it. But with a book, you have to actively bring information in. So you can give someone a book um, and then they will read it at their own pace. So that's what those two examples are. Um, and notice that, that is like, I just made a, invented a, uh, with two functions, um, a few lines of code, made something that is streams, no dependencies, really simple. Um, and then you can, can, can connect them together um, by running them out right to left. So we just get the value stream and we create the drain stream that returns a function that we pass the, the start of the stream to. Now that's, that's confusing. 
um, because it's right to left and that's weird and you have to think about all these layers and stuff in your head. So I would just I just made a function that did that for you and you just pass things left to right and then that you can read that like um, like a, a natural language and it's much much easier to understand. So a map is also um, also simple for some value of simple. So we have a function that, oh sorry, that's wrong, that should be function. Um, function that returns, that returns a reader stream and then, so it's like that returns a reader, which is a person who can read a book. When you give them a book, they give you another book, which you pass to the next reader. Um, this also makes it really easy to combine, to define a stream in terms of like three different streams. So you can take this like triple function, which takes three transform streams and returns one stream. Um, basically, a stream is just a function. So you return a function that takes a book, and then you pass it to all the streams and return the book from the last function. Um, or you can just use the pull stream, the pull function, um, which is much easier. Um, so pull streams are really simple um, for some for some kind of easy to reason about for some value of easy. Um, I think stuff is always going to be hard. Um, but this is kind of simple because it simplifies the, the state space. So you can read a stream. Uh, you, can, you can read a stream, but you, whenever you call read, you know you're either going to get the end or the data. Um, and if you don't call the read, you're paused. So one thing that some criticize about this is that if you don't call read and there's an error, you won't know until you ask for it. Um, that's what makes it easier to deal with. Um, otherwise, you have to have all of this extra error handling stuff. Um, another interesting thing is that uh, back pressure is really simple. Back pressure can propagate instantly because here we have the mapper function. Now, this is completely synchronous, but it works with, a synch with synchronous inputs and outputs. So, we have we applied this map function, which if we have some async thing, when that thing calls back, we just quickly transform it and then pass it on um, with no extra complexity. So I like I use pull streams now, um, but I'm I'm we I'm weird. Um, I haven't really tried to um, convince everyone to use them because that's too hard. Um, they solve my problem. Um, but normally I expose a node stream as well on my module so that other people can use them. And it's very easy to, to convert between, like if a stream has the right things, if it has back pressure and errors and stuff like this, then you can, you can convert one to the other. And um, so for my, for, because I get to write my code how I want to write it, um, I use pull streams. But if I want someone else to use it, I put a regular stream on the outside um, so that it's easy to consume. So, which sort of stream is best? Whatever, don't know. Um, you answer that question yourself. So, part five. A new hero cometh. So Node.js is kind of like anti, uh, anti specs. It's just like built by a community, basically. Um, nobody can tell anyone else what to do or what is a good idea. Um, but the browser is the opposite. The browser has all these like spec committees that each, um, that where the challenges just come to an agreement because independent browsers have to implement something that's nearly compatible. Um, and it is impressively compatible, I think. Um, and if you've given them, if you gave any of them half a chance, if they thought that they could become the one browser by become, being incompatible, they would do it. Um, it's only because no one can pick what browser your, your, um, the people that go into your website um, can choose. I will choose that keeps them basically um, honest. So, so most people in Node just aren't into specs. Um, but then there's this one guy. So along comes a hero who understands Node but also spec committees. So that, that guy's name is Dominic Denicola. Um, so he, he is, 
um, penetrating the Vorgon, the Vorgon Fortress um, and, this, and is working on a spec and participating in really long email list discussions and so on and so on um, uh, among other things about how st streams might work in the browser. Now if we get streams in the browser that'll be really great. Um, they'll probably be a bit, bit different as well. They, they probably aren't going to be like Node, exactly like Node streams because um, the spec committee thinks that Node programmers are all like upstart upstart hipsters and, and don't know what they're talking about, which is probably true actually. Um, it'll probably use promises. Um, do people know promises? They're like, they're not, they're like the, they solve callback hell, but you have to read it, but the price is you ha there has to be a spec. Um, callbacks, um, co so promises were once in Node, in, um, the zero, in the like 0 0.1 um, era, um, before, I, before I came to Node. But there were promises and they got booted out because um, no one could agree exactly what a, what a promise was. Um, but callbacks were simple. But I think there's going to be promises because um, <coughs> spec writers rule the browser world and don't mix into promises, so uh, there might be promises. But um, so it might be a little bit weird. Maybe not how I would have done it, but it'll be good enough. Um, it'll have all of the things that streams need to have, and if you don't like it, you better polyfill those streams to whatever you like. Um, probably node streams will be a popular choice, um, or whatever. Um, thank you. If, this, if, the stream is, if one of the streams is paused and you write to it, that stream should collect that data for a while um, until it gets passed on. But it depends on what kind of, um, like streams are very general and there's a huge amount of ways you can use them. Um, so um, you need to ask a more specific question. What kind of, what, what sort of, what's in the string? What kind of string is it? Like what, what's, what does the string represent? I don't know, a message, hello, my right. name. Right. And I just want to stream my name out to the world. Yeah, so it's just some plain text. Yeah, so yeah. would it be just passed around or, uh, for example, from a performance perspective, mm -hmm. is there any copying or just passing? Or is oh, it right. Or um, so it's basically variables being passed around the references. Yeah. Um, well, within a process, it will be. It'll be. Um, it will just be passed. Um, although you don't. It doesn't make sense to pass it through a whole bunch of things unless it's actually being transformed in some way. If you are just like say getting it from a file and sending it to a thing, then it reads it out of one interface and writes it straight to another interface. Um, and if you use buffers. Um, buffers are efficient because you can just pass that memory to there, to, from one place to one place, and then you don't have to, one of the overheads in Node is converting from um, C types into JavaScript types, so there's actually quite a bit of overhead when you have a binding, because that you end up copying, well you end up copying memory, but Node's optimized to the point where copying memory um, becomes um, a noticeable source bot. But a buffer is um, a special um, block of memory that's not in the V8 heap. So it's just, it's just plain um, you know, um, continuous memory. So you get one thing says, I got this memory, and then you pass it to the, say you, you read it from a file and then write it to an HTTP response. Um, JavaScript decides what to do, but it doesn't necessarily pass that 
that stream. So um, if you stick to buffers, you're just, you're just passing references and not copying. Uh, what if I change the buffer while it's in the stream? You can totally mutate it. That's, uh, that don't, don't, um, to functional programmers I didn't say that, but, um, so yeah. Could, Sorry? So in this case you could mutate your buffer. Yep. Buffers are totally mutable. Yep. Mm -hmm. You said with um, stream pumps that there's this problem that uh, pauses have to propagate backwards. Yeah. And you'd like to see them that they can be given straight back to the, the source. Yeah. But if you have just uh, ordinary I/O interfaces, then they could be on a totally different machine. Yes. So. Um, uh, absolutely. So this really is a is a benefit for um, object streams within your process, um, within um, across um, processes. Um, total, uh, then you don't have that um, you don't have that luxury, and um, you're absolutely right. Um, in fact, it's uh, worth noting that um, say within. Um, that some, some, in, in real life, um, sometimes you get streams that are both pull and push in different parts. Um, for example, in, um, in networking, in TCP, um, in it, you have a part that is a push stream and then a part that's a pull stream. So when you send something across the network, First you push it into a buffer um, that's like, tell the kernel, you've got to send this. Then the networking stack um, decides what rate it wants to send it. But then, um, so if you, if you create a new TCP, TCP connection, um, you start just emitting data immediately. You, set, you start sending some connect packets, but then you just start squirting data out. So you don't wait for like the um, acknowledgement before you start sending data. So first you're just throwing data over the internet. And then they sometimes throw back um, pause messages, and that makes you slow down. But then at the other side, that lands and gets put into a buffer, and then the program, the application on that side, pulls the data out. And if that buffer fills up, then um, that will send the, the NAX back, tell it to slow down. Um, because if the buffer is full and then coming stuff, comes in, there'd be no place to put it, so that end will just drop it. And then another thing will arrive and then it will send back an act saying that that's not what I was um, ready for yet. Um, so when you combine a pull stream and a push stream, you get a pump stream. So you get that um, in TCP and I think it's the right decision um, for TCP, although there's also, I read an article once by um, uh, Peter Hitchens who created um, well, he's partially um, was a significant contributor to creating a thing called Zero MQ. Has anyone heard of Zero MQ? No, no. Uh, totally worth uh, checking out. So it's a it's an, a new it's like a um, a cross platform socket library that gives you um, message passing. So it's more like um, it gives you. Um, delimited streams, kind of like object streams, well a buffer is like you would get a message which has bounds, not just continuous data. Um, and it can be seen over a whole bunch of different transports and you can have different things. It's quite um, impressive, but um, I've read the documentation but haven't actually used it because it's because um, in Node, um, Node does streams well enough that you don't need to use it. But in other languages that don't have good streams, then um, you need stuff like that. Yeah. And he, anyway, he has a he has an article about how he talks about how um, TCP is 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 stupid, and um, it should have been. I think I think he does advocate a more pull um, stream sort of um, interface. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Speaking of streams, what do you think of that? Oh, sorry? 
speaking of streams, what do you think about the new rule system that one? Gulp? Oh, um, I think Gulp is much better, sounds much better than Grunt. Um, but to be honest, um, I just use um, Unix pipes. So Unix pipes are, are like, basically, Gulp sounds better than Grunt because it sounds more like Unix pipes. Um, but I think, um, but to be honest, that's just my, my sense of smell because I haven't actually used it and I haven't, um, I haven't even read the documentation or anything like that. But um, it, it, seemed, it definitely, I think it's definitely heading in the right direction. But um, the right answer has been in front of our nose the entire time, which is because um, Unix streams were like invented in the um, in the like uh, late 60s. Um, but the thing that they the, the only thing they, they can't really do very well is um, you, they don't do duplex streams very well for things where you have a pipeline of like here's an input you know uh, here's a file and we pipe it to grep um, that works great um, but you can't create a server in, in Unix um, easily. Um, normally, like traditionally when they had servers, you would have a server and you'd pass uh, a script to it and then it would start a process for each time like a connection came in, it would start a, it would start a new program and then take the standard output of that program and that would be the HTML response. And that's like how the like CGI bin and how like Apache and how like PHP works and that sort of stuff. And the great win of Node is that it um, basically added the thing to Unix that it never had, which was easy to create, making it easy to create servers. Um, there isn't another language out of the box where you can just create servers easily. And that was because they all had um, blocking interfaces for everything. And it was this sort of great uh, accident of history that we got, because um, JavaScript was a, you know, a front-end language that nobody took seriously, um, which turned out to be a, um, a blessing in disguise, because then when later, when you needed to build scalable web servers, um, Node, oh sorry, JavaScript had already been refined and optimized for um, 10 years. Well, more than 10 years actually, like 15 years. Um, but it had been kept safely away from a lot of bad ideas. Um, like one thing that Node, of all the things that, like Node gets basically everything, everything it does, it gets it basically right. It does, it makes the right, for the like big picture things. The, it has lots of, you know, there's still problems about specific ways it does things. Um, but, the, but the most perfect thing um, is the module system. A module system is really, really good, and there's no other um, module that no other module system that I'm aware of that um, is comparable. Um, and the other um, fun-oriented languages like uh, Ruby and Python and stuff, they have quite terrible module systems. But they have the sort of module, module systems you'd expect because they have the sort of module systems that nearly everything has, which is that you know it adds it to the global scope, and you can only have one version of one program. Uh, one version, one named version, sorry, one version of one named module per program. Um, but Node can have as many, can have a whole bunch, if you like, each module gets its own dependencies. And this is um, something you don't notice until you've written fairly large programs, but um, means that, basically it means that you can, um, you know, like, so regular program, regular other programs, it's like if you buy a new toaster and the toaster has a new, has, an, has a, a thermostat in it that's the same brand as the thermostat in your oven, except of course it's a toaster thermostat, so it's a different version of the th thermostat. Um, so in most languages, this would mean that your oven now stops working because you can only have one version of this thermostat module and it's now, you know, you can't decide which one you need. now. Real life doesn't work like that, um, but most programming languages do. Um, Node doesn't work like that. Node, you can have two different versions of the same thermostat, um, and everything, everything's great. Cool. Thanks.
Thank you very much.